Hello, everybody. I don't know if you are in the night, in the morning, in the afternoon. So good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good day to everybody that is joining this virtual event, Role of Climate Smart and Responsible Mining in the Transition with APCO Worldwide, which APCO Worldwide is organizing in partnership with the International Chamber of Commerce, ICC, during COP27. Uh, in 2021, the IPCC reported that without immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to close to 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees will be beyond reach. COP26 in Glasgow succeeded in its mission to keep 1.5 alive. But to make that vision a reality, governments, business, and civil society need to unite in an unprecedented effort to shift from aspirations and commitments to collaborative action at real scale. So in this session, we are going to talk about mining with three experts and experiencing, experienced uh, pardon, um, uh, uh, persons that will uh, tell us what their industry are doing for this. So we have with us uh, Laurent Chocolet datou He is Vice President of Public Affairs, International Copper Association. We also have Christian Spano, Director, Innovation International Council on Mining and Metals. And we also have Martin Dietrich, Brau, he is uh, lead. He lead researcher, Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. I will present each of them uh, better when we uh, when we talk with them, and we are going to start with Laurent Laurent Chocolé Datou, uh, and the session will be uh, in this in the following format. We are going to ask them uh, two or three questions. They will have like five four minutes to answer each question. And then we'll have a chat uh, between them and also with you if you have questions and you can send your questions so these experts can answer them. So uh, we are going to uh, start with Laurent Chocolet Datou. Laurent leads the International Copper Association public affairs operations, including two global programs, material stewardship and industry reputation. Uh, he's a diplomat at heart. Laurent enjoys navigating issues with high geographical and topical diversity, identifying how best to serve members' business needs, and achieving positive outcomes through internal and external collaborations. To date, his favorite project has been designing the organization's strategy for reputation build building. Also, Laurent is, I have to tell you, a semi-professional musician, and maybe we can lose him because he has been thinking on pursuing music full-time. Laurent, good day. How are you? I'm good, Isabel. Thank you for, for having me. I, I don't think uh, I'm, I'm of the age that will allow me to continue my, my dream of becoming a professional musician. So let's, let's spark that. Uh, I'll stick with Coppola for the time. Ah, you never know, Laurent. You never know. <laughs> Laurent, Okay, so let me ask you, uh, sustainable mining is not only about supplying clean minerals, but also how we can satisfy a growing demand and increasing accountability. A recent report published by the World Bank showed that copper is the one mineral that is needed the most across all renewable energy sources. How is your industry preparing for, to satisfy this growing demand by the energy transition in a sustainable way? What are some relevant examples that you could share with us? Thank you, Isabel. Um, yes, copper has been receiving a lot of attention of late. Um, that is largely due to the, the properties of the metal, um, one of the best uh, thermal electrical conductors, um, a strategic metal for sectors like construction, energy, um, uh, transportation, electronics. Um, and in fact, if you if you want to put a figure to it, two thirds of um, the world GHG emissions, as we know them, can be abated through technologies, all of which involve copper. It's quite simple. Copper would be in two thirds of those uh, abatement technologies. Uh, the consensus is that um, over the energy transition and due to it, the demand for copper will double by mid-century, possibly before, according to some forecasts. Uh, and of course, this doesn't go without uh, interrogations as to the ability to ramp up and also 
the methods of ramping up and, and the impact of ramping up such uh, to, to meet such demand. Now, a share of the demand can be met through recycling. That's already the case today. But there is quite clearly a situation in which um, there's no situation in which re recycling could, could plug the gap, basically. And so mineral extraction is going to remain the bulk of, of what's needed to, to meet demand. If you want to think about emissions as we know them today, so we have, we've done some evaluation uh, with 20, 2018 as the reference year. 85% of GHG emissions take place at the extraction, ref, uh, smelting and refining stage. The remaining 15 in the subsequent stages of the copper transformation. So clearly, from an ICA perspective, the bulk of the effort is with us. Um, we recognize that. Um, but because of the growth in demand that I was talking about, um, in any scenario, whether we do nothing or we do something, emissions will grow between now and 2050. And of course, that goes against the, the, the goal that most industries have right now and governments to reach net zero by 2050. So how are we going to do that? And I'll come to that perhaps in a second question. But let me tell you a little bit about examples of what uh, ICA members are doing to reduce their uh, carbon footprint. Um, uh, and most of them, I must say, are engaged in those efforts. So, for example, in uh, Chile, uh, the, the leading copper producing country, one of our members has switched completely to renewable energy for all its operations. Um, it started uh, very, you know, very recently, 2020, I think it was, and in a matter of a few years has now switched completely through power purchase agreements. That's the way they've done it. Um, Many other members are following the same path at different paces, though, with a mix of on-site production um, projects, energy production projects, uh, and energy supply agreements, much like the, the members that I cited in the first place. Um, the, the aim of all of them, pretty much, is to switch away from fossil, uh, if possible, by the end of the decade. And, and that's manifests itself through you know, a variety of, of forms from purchasing a, a green electricity from, from the grid to creating their own means or a mix thereof. Um, our evaluation overall is that the shift to decarbonize electricity, either from the grid or through self-production uh, on site, is the main driver to help our industry meet our climate goals. Uh, that, that's really the, the precondition to anything being possible. On the innovation and energy efficiency uh, side, uh, as far as production is concerned, um, many ICA members are implementing uh, technolog technological solutions that enable efficiency gains, whether it's in the rock cutting or grinding, heat reuse, or by using um, AI technologies or 5G in mining automation. And we've got multiple examples of that in all regions um, uh, in which our members are operating. On the equipment side, and I'm sure Christian will confirm that in a minute, uh, there are multiple pilot projects on the way to um, uh, introduce green hydrogen or electricity into haulage trucks, as well as excavators and drills. Um, and the same goes for smelting furnaces, where natural gas could in time be replaced with biogas. Um, but again, we, we're talking, f for the most part, you know, pilot projects. It's not a widespread effort that you can recognize across all regions and all companies, or yet let alone all sites. But it's a trend that you know those things are being actively piloted and hopefully will, will come to scale. Let me move to another aspect, uh, which is responsible production itself. Um, the ICA a few years ago instigated the creation of a, an assurance framework called the, the Copper Mark. Now, the Copper Mark is uh, an independent social and environmental assurance program that allows mining candidate sites to demonstrate their adherence to internationally recognized uh, responsible production standards. Uh, it was launched in 2020. We're now uh, hedging towards the end of 23. In just uh, sh three short years, uh, copper mine sites that have been awarded copper mark through independent verification represent approximately 20% of uh, global copper production. So we, we're on, on track, if you will, to expand, hopefully, the influence of the copper mark and uh, in incentivize members of the copper industry at large to embrace uh, the framework in order to guarantee that copper is produced according to the highest possible uh, standards of responsible production. 
I would add, uh, it's slightly outside of climate, nevertheless uh, related, uh, that um, many copper producers, many ICA members have shown a, a growing interest uh, in um, circularity, both in the mine and further down the, the value chain. Um, several smel smelters at ICA, we have a few smelters among our members, have developed hybrid operations, including recycling facilities, and some are even uh, in the process of establishing dedicating recycling sites in Europe and the United States. Um, secondary copper, as we traditionally call it, has a lesser carbon footprint than, than, than primary, and that's uh, one of the motivations for this uh, move. And then I'll say that uh, along with some of our partners, including ICMM, uh, we will uh, we're intent on pursuing uh, in the coming years an agenda of dialogue and action to ensure that um, copper, the material, retains its value as long as possible throughout its life cycle. Um, you know, as, produ as primarily producers with a lesser handle on an aspect of things, but we've, we're committing to opening the dialogue with the rest of the value chain to make sure we recover as much copper at end of life as we can possibly uh, do globally to, to make sure it retains its value throughout the life cycle. Now, none of these evolutions will be truly successful unless we successful ourselves in bringing along communities and emerging communities uh, along a just transition line. Um, and to us, that means adopting holistic approaches to sustainable development uh, in which the do no harm mindset evolves into one of net positive for people in nature. And again, the vast majority of our members are engaged on this path and this is work we intend on deepening going forward. So in those short minutes, I hope I haven't exceeded my time. I hope I've given you an overview of what we're, what we're at in terms of climate mitigation and assaulted issues. Yes, uh, Laurent, well, the, ch the challenges are, are enormous, big challenges, but I think uh, you are optimistic. You, the trend, you're in the right trend for responsible production standards and, uh, and, and on the recognition of where are the main challenges of uh, the industry. And you said that they were in, for example, the extraction, that you have to recognize that. And uh, well, maybe you can later tell us if, uh, uh, if you're working with uh, allies or if you can work with governments or if you uh, are doing this only in the, in the industry itself. But uh, let, me, let me go uh, now with uh, Christian and, and then we come back to these, uh, to these things because I think that we can do this in the, in the later conversation. So Christian Spano, hello, Christian. He is, uh, let me see because I don't, I don't know everything. Christian Spano is the uh, Director in Innovation International Council on Mining and Metals. He started his career in Peru and Latin America in the forestry and energy sectors before moving first to renewables and power, and then for the last 10 years to the mining and metals industry. While working for ICMM, uh, member Anglo-American Christian gained experience of working on innovation in a socioeconomic develop development context. This was followed by roles at World Economic Forum and Systemic, where Christian focused on business models, regulation, and finance. He has also been exposed to impact investing, where he has had the chance to support disruptive technologies entering the mining and metals space. Christian is an economist with an MSc degree in international development from the London School of Economics and a postgraduate diploma in strategy and innovation from the University of Oxford. Uh, by the way, Christian loves cycling and cooking and spending time with his family. Christ Christian, hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Great to be here with you and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, where are you, Christian? I'm at home in London. In London. Richmond. Okay. <laughs> so, Christian, much attention has been placed on uh, net zero strategies. However, one of the most important outcomes of the celebration of the 50 Stockholm Con Convention this year was the position of the bi biodiversity conservation and waste management as equally important challenges to climate change. Based on this, it has become imperative for private and public organizations alike 
to look into the circular, circular use of the resources as a mean for environmental conservation and sustainable development. What lesson have you seen can be taking, taken uh, from net zero strategies that could be easily applicable towards a circularity strategy? Uh, what are the similar and different barriers you have identified? Thank you. Uh, I, the first thing I will have to say and react very quickly is that in this journey for to net zero, there is nothing simple. <laughs> the okay. challenge is huge. And I think that is what it makes it uh, very exciting. I, 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 instead of being afraid of this challenge or being turned off for the challenge, I think the fact that it's complex, big and transformational is what really excites me. It's the contribution that we have to make. It's not a little change here, a little bit more of that on the edges. It's, it's a true transformation that we are already experiencing. So I just I would just like to to put that not caveat but put that in the background. The, the second point I want to make is that it's interesting when we think about all these big topics, right? Biodiversity, circular economy, climate change. I mean, these are all big topics. If we keep treating them separately, we we don't have the capacity to really deliver to all of them. We need to treat them systemically. And the reason why I would suggest to look at them systemically is because we were we live in a in a single world where everything is a system, everything comes together within a system. And so for, for each of our documents, we put them in different bullet points, but in reality, they operate within a system. So that, that I think it's very important for us to acknowledge, uh, even how we are organized in our organizations, how we set meetings, how we set discussions, let's start looking at things systemically. Going deep into your into your, the point that you're raising and applying this concept of uh, dealing with things systemically, if you take the circular economy and you take climate change, carbon emissions is a waste stream. So what we're actually trying to do is reduce a waste stream to zero. That's the circular economy. So we can have a, a very um, uh, easy entry into climate through the lens of the circular economy. The difference that you get on the circular economy is that the circular economy requires a system level change. Circular economy is not a little bit of recycling. It's not a little bit of efficiency. It's not applying a little bit of reduction in the current system, in the current way of operating or consuming something. The circular economy is looking at how, how things are done today in our economy, in our society, and thinking about redesigning them. Redesign how we consume products, redesign the product itself, redesign the system that takes the product during its life cycle and at the end, redesigning the way we take the materials out of the ground is a redesigning strategy. And I want to make this point very clear because the more we go on uh, cornering the circular economy as recycling, we're losing this battle. Recycling comes late, 19, you know, in, in 40 years, in 50 years and small. It doesn't create any, any systemic change. The circular economy is not recycling. Recycling is one of the levers in the circular economy strategy, which is about a systemic change. Now, how, how does this link with net zero strategies? We need acceleration. We have to go into a process where we look at our system and we change it in a way that is accelerated. And so in mining and metals, you can summarize it in having natural stocks, which is our mines, and urban stocks. And what is happening now is that we're putting minerals and metals from the natural stock into the urban stocks. We have $150 trillion of materials in the current economy that we haven't designed for recovery. We have lost, basically, $150 trillion of value because we didn't think about the system in a way that we could recover those materials at any time efficiently. Now, going forward, when we think about the energy transition and we think about copper, we think about steel, and we think the battery-related uh, materials, we really need to make an effort for those materials that are entering today. They have to enter into products and infrastructure that are designed to recover at any point in time. Now, this is very important for climate, because if we don't do that, we're going to be operating in the current system that is very unlikely to hit a 1.5C uh, scenario. If we design for early recovery or recovery at any point in time, 
we're going to be much more efficient in the way we recover. We're going to lose, use less energy and we're going to be creating no waste, at least with the new stock. The old stock, we need to develop technologies and innovation to try to recover as much as we can. But we need to be aware of that. In mining specifically, in our targets for, for net zero, for example, our, our commitment at ICMM to become net zero by 2050 in scope one and two, we really need to think about the land where we mine as a renewable uh, resource. The land is a renewable resource. It's not a disposable resource. And why this is important? Because the moment we think about that and we think about our commitments, we're bringing renewable energy close to that land. We're bringing climate-based solutions in the form of forestry and regenerative agriculture. We're bringing a number of new productivity areas to that land. That land becomes something that can last forever before, during, and after the life of the mine. And that is closely linked to the definition of nature positive because you are allowing that land to become a renewable resource. And that is the design element that I'm bringing here. Now, the same happens with the stock that we are creating in the cities. We really need to think about at the stock. Let's forget about defining the circular economy as how to deal with waste. We, we need to think about minerals and metals as durable materials that are building stocks that we have to use as soon as we can. Let's design for that. So in conclusion, if we think about the net zero strategy, if we have land that is perceived and used as a renewable resource, we're going to be going into the nature positive or close. I mean, it needs to be defined, but we're going to be closer into the nature positive space. We're going to be creating all those zero carbon technologies in land where the mining operation is happening. And if we use those stocks in designing for recovery, we're going to be needing le less energy to recover it. And we're going to have more resources available in the economy. That is much more likely to give us a chance to be aligned with a 1.5 degree scenario. That is the link that I see between the circular economy and the climate uh, conversation. I'll leave it there. Christian, uh, you want to redesign the world, uh, but now that you uh, share with us how can we uh, how we, we can do that, uh, can you can you share with us uh, in two three minutes uh, on your experience on the field? Uh, two or one example very practical that you have been working on? On, on, on this model? Yes. I mean, it, even when you think about the, the, the current technologies, I mean, uh, what we progress in, 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 the, um, in the ICMM, no? so you, you get some members, for example, that are starting to recover sands from tailings. And so what, what is happening with that approach is that suddenly a liability like a tailings becomes a, a, a source of income and a source of job creation in a source of wealth at the site level. And that is part of the transition. It's still not redesigning the system, but it's allowing you to think about a liability in a way that is actually something that, that works. The same happens with recovery of metals from, from tailings. And I'm focusing on tailings because there is a lot of work that is happening once you have produced the tailings, but also to not produce it. A lot of our, 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 our members are looking at uh, future smart mining, and things like, you know, course rotation, in situ leaching, and many aspects that have to do to how you mine to be able to get to a state where you don't produce tailings and you can actually look at the land in a way of a renewable resource. There's, of course, there is a lot of effort in uh, reforestation, afforestation, supporting regenerative agriculture. As uh, 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 Laurent was saying, a lot of efforts in bringing renewable energy. But we're, we're seeing these efforts um, at the starting stage, the end state is treating that piece of land and thinking about it, this is a renewable resource. How I, as a miner, can make sure that all the elements that I bring for a zero emissions strategy stay in this land, add value to this land, and contribute to that, to that effort. We have many, I mean, we have uh, the examples, for example, with, um, with uh, um, the cleaner and safer vehicle strategy, where you see that not only there are many whole tracks that, by the way, consume up to between 3,000 and 9,000 uh, liters of diesel a day. They are being tested in a trolley assist technology. You have green hydrogen technology. You have battery technology. And with that, what, what we have recognized is that the effort outside the mine, the volume of renewable electricity that you need, the battery management that you need, the hydrogen corridors that you need, you know, members are starting to put that in place in South Africa, for example, Anglo-American with green hydrogen uh, we have Newmont, we have uh, working with, uh, with battery-led uh, technology, 
we have Rio Tinto working uh, with smaller vehicles that are a combination of um, automation and, and and electrification. There are so so many. It, it's a boom of of, uh, of pilots. That is what gives me uh, the, the the courage to to be here and say that this massive challenge we have ahead is it, we shouldn't fear it. We should be feeling excited about it. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, now I want to welcome Martin Brauch, uh, Martin Dieter Brauch, right? Dietrich, Dietrich, Dietrich Brauch. He is in New York. He's a lead researcher at CCSI, uh, Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. He leads economic and legal research, training, and advisory work with a focus on legal and policy frameworks and practices for sustainable investment to achieve climate change mitigation and adaptation goals, including uh, through decarbonization and a just transition to net zero emission energy systems and economies. His work centers on the following focus areas at CCSI, climate change, energy transition, extractive industries, and investment law and policy. He has worked extensively with developing countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Prior to joining CCSI, he worked as international law advisor at a global think tank, in-house counsel at a media conglomerate, and associate attorney at a boutique law firm. As a graduate student, he undertook a legal internship at United Nations Climate Change. He received a BA in economics, a bachelor of laws, and a specialization certificate in environmental law from the Federal University of Pelotas, Brazil. He holds an LM M in International Legal Studies from NYU School of Law, where he was an International Law Fellow. I know that he speaks English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish. So, hola, Martín, ¿cómo estás? Hola, Babel, ¿cómo estás? Es un gusto. It's a pleasure. Martín, so since your co-panelists here represent private sector views, I'd appreciate if you could bring your academic perspective on the role of governments in ensuring that mining for the transition is climate smart and responsible. What do you think about that? Thank you so much, uh, Isabel. Thank you to APCO Worldwide and the ICC for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think it will be interesting to, to complement the views here from the private sector with the role of governments. And essentially what we're looking at, at here when we uh, think of ensuring a climate smart and responsible um, mining activity in this context of the, the transition to, to net zero emissions is to, to have government policy that will facilitate, encourage, or require the measures that both uh, Laurent and um, Christian have been talking about that mining companies are already, already taking to reduce their emissions, removing policy barriers that make it more difficult and costly for mining companies to adopt those measures. So Laurent, for example, mentioned uh, the switch away from fossil fuels, increased use of, of renewable power, whether from the grid or through on-site production, increasing the use of green hydrogen, electrifying transportation in the mines, increasing um, efficiency standards. And Christian was also bringing up important points about the circular economy, conserving and, and recovering forests and, and biodiversity, et cetera. All these elements need uh, an underlying policy uh, planning and, and framework uh, that governments need to enact to support or in some cases to require mining uh, companies to, uh, to, to perform under these areas. So here at CCSI, we conduct research on these uh, legal and policy frameworks. And starting from the acknowledgement that the green energy transition will be exceedingly mineral intensive. We uh, took a closer look at the need to um, increase production of critical minerals. And in our view, sometimes those forecasts of increased demand are uh, bullish. They rest on uncertain terrain because there are several factors. Technology is consistently uh, improving, adapting to increase mineral performance. There may be substitutions because of high mineral prices or supply scares. 
there may be reduced primary extraction because of the circular economy, uh, as Christian was, was saying, we're improving design of products to use minerals more in a smarter way. We're increasing recycling and reuse. We're recovering more materials from tailings. And we're, we may also be relying more on agro mining and bio mining. So all of these changes in this uh, complex uh, ecosystem means, uh, th these changes mean that um, uh, um, increasing the primary extraction of critical minerals could lead to oversupply and uh, over outstrip the demand and end up leading to minimal benefits for uh, countries that don't plan. So governments, along with mining sector actors that are seeking to optimize the value of this transition should heed caution is our uh, main recommendation here at CCSI when they're prom promoting and pursuing the promotion, uh, the, the extraction of critical minerals. So examples of planning and policy measures that governments can take include recognizing that not all the minerals will be the same. Each potential project has to be analyzed in, in details. It shouldn't be assumed that these globalized forecasts will materialize in each in individual project. It's important to understand the global levels of investment in any given commodity to avoid this overinvestment. Governments need to build scenario and sensitivity analysis capacity to understand model the different scenarios for future demand, for prices, what this means for the economics of a proposed mine that the government may have an opportunity to adopt. Then we have to look at um, basic elements such as the economic uh, spillover effects uh, from new technology, from this new uh, zero carbon technology in mining, what impact it will have on local employment, on local inputs of goods and services, shared use of infrastructure, social developments of projects, whether these mining projects provide an anchor for economic diversification, and then planning the potential fiscal benefits from the proposed mines. So what are the expected tax and royalty re revenues? Um, does the government have a good fiscal model for proposed projects? Um, and also carefully considering whether there would be tax incentives uh, required. Importantly as well, one important, uh, one other element of planning here is to ensure meaningful civil society consultation and engagement as colleagues have already brought up here it's it goes beyond guaranteeing that the project is accepted by the local communities or that the local communities don't oppose the, the the community mining can only be considered climate smart and responsible if the project promotes and improves the well-being of local communities it go it includes jobs income economic growth development government revenues that will reflect in public investment etc but it also in, especially in this context of climate change, it also includes uh, making mining climate smart, smart and responsible by enhancing community resilience to climate impacts and supporting community adaptation to, to climate change. So governments have an important role to provide accessible information mechanisms to allow communities to meaningfully engage in these processes. Uh, decide uh, that decide whether and where mines will be uh, located, um, and respect should be um, their their rights to uh, free, prior, and informed cons uh, consent, and other human rights should also be uh, respected. And we have several publications on uh, our website ccsi.columbia.edu. Uh, on how um, mining companies or how governments and mining companies can collaborate in this space. Uh, Martin, you mentioned the incentives. Uh, what about the law? You have extensive research experience in, in how legal mechanisms can leverage the mining sector. Could you please give us examples of how legal provisions uh, can push mining companies to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions or contribute to climate change mitigation? Absolutely. So in our view, first and foremost, climate change considerations as they apply to the mining sector should be incorporated in the climate, environmental, water, forestry, energy or mining laws of the countries. Uh, for example, the National Determined Contribution and the National Adaptation Plan, the NDC, the, the MAP should be incorporated into the law. There should be rules 
for their implementation, how they will apply specifically to the mining sector, how the mining sector will contribute to their uh, achievements. And then as a second or a stopgap measure, recognizing that the pace of legislative process is often slow, countries often don't have the legislation that um, promotes the climate change mitigation and adaptation measures, um, then governments could also resort to contracts as a stopgap measure to compel the mining sector to shift to climate sensitive pra practices. So um, even though we recognize that laws are the ideal instruments to uh, laws and regulations to regulate this uh, contribution from the mining sector to, to climate change adaptation and mitigation, governments can still use model mining development agreements or negotiate climate related contractual clauses as a clauses as a stopgap measure in the absence of, of these laws. And we have uh, at CCSI several publications where we explore how uh, governments are using and how they can use investor state uh, contracts to advance climate goals in the context of, of the mining sector. I can give a few examples uh, here on how, because I think we tend to focus a little bit too much on uh, mitigation, right? And the, the path to mitigation colleagues have already uh, sort of laid out here. We need to reduce emissions. We need to electrify, improve uh, energy efficiency, but what about adaptation? We have to remember that mining is inherently hazardous by nature. It in introduces risks and impacts that can be exacerbated by climate change. So for example, mining competes with communities for water and water stress may be increasing because of climate change. And mining also exacerbates risks and impacts of climate related events. For example, mining can contribute to deforestation which then exacerbates erosion, landslides, flooding in a raging season, which as we know, could be uh, more frequent in, in climate change uh, scenarios. So measures that um, governments along with companies should, should pay attention to in, in embed in their laws and in their contracts is to strengthen, for example, environmental social impact assessments and environmental and social management plans to uh, require climate risk assessments, to require community vulnerability uh, assessments, uh, essentially requiring mining companies to support and comply with the national adaptation plans, the NAPs that I was mentioning earlier, provide uh, also support uh, climate adaptation guidelines with, where governments have already developed these instruments. Um, regulation and contracts can uh, be useful to regulate water use, condition the grant of water rights uh, on companies to um, commitments on water use efficiency, penalties for overuse uh, of water, um, you know, uh, laws and, and contracts can also preserve the government's ability to alter the water allocation to mining operations based on the fluctuations on the amount of available water or the number of users that will rely on these uh, water sources. It's just important to integrate climate risks and just transition aspects into closure and decommissioning plans by uh, companies setting aside plans for the end of the mining uh, project, for the climate resilient rehabilitation of the project site, to reskill the workforce, etc. All these considerations are intrinsically related to, to climate change and should be embedded in, um, in the legal and, and regulatory framework. Also requiring mining companies to, to purchase insurance policies, that take into consideration both the global risks associated with climate change, but also localized um, considerations and any additional insurance for uh, site-specific risks that may result from climate change. So these are just a few examples and more are listed on our website, ccsi.columbia.edu. Thank you, Martin. And I saw that Laurent was writing something. I bet that he has some things to say about uh, all these incentives or obstacles uh, with governments and law. Uh, Laurent, can you share uh, your uh, with your experience with us? Uh, I would say yes and no, Isabel, because. Um... Uh, ICA is a global industry association, and unfortunately, there isn't a global government. So, uh, a lot of the conversations that will that take place or will have to take place are essentially between 
uh, the local representation of our of our members uh, ultimately. But I have a few things to say. You're right. Um, the we will be issuing in, a, in the next few months our pathway to net zero, which is our detailed roadmap to reaching net zero by 2050. You might say, you know, a bit late. No, it's not. Uh, doing things right takes time. We've done the quantification, the scenarios, the everything. And there's a chapter in there, which you'll discover in a few months, which is an, um, uh, framework conditions, which talk to some of the issues that both Christian and Martin talked about. Um, product design. You know, we how do we and governments, I'm sure, have a role to play there. How do we um, enact laws that help guide the industry towards designing products that can be easily dismantled uh, for recycling or, in, or indeed readapted quickly for reuse or whatever? You know, what's the role of laws and regulations there? I don't have the answer. I'm just saying that's a, that's a conversation. Um, permitting, I accept that we should perhaps you know consider twice opening new mines but given demand prospects that's certainly an issue so rather than pushing it uh, under the, the rug uh, there's a conversation about how do we attach perhaps some of the conditions that martin talked about into the new permitting um, laws um, but equally how do we f how do we accelerate permitting because um Let's, let's face it, I mean, I'm talking for copper now, but it's the same for all the metals. If there aren't, if there isn't the supply that's required for the transition, I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, the transition will happen. And so there's a balancing act there between figuring out the recovery of, of um, secondary material, accelerating the production of primary material, but all of that against sustainability goals. And, and that, <clears throat> that has, again, here again, I think policy and regulations have a role to to play. Um, carbon pricing, and I don't want to go straight to carbon taxation, but let's just talk about pricing. Um, if you look at the, the macroeconomic and political geopolitical context today, there's one industry that's benefiting at the moment, that's the fossil fuel industry. Now, how do we um, get the incentives um, rights there in terms of you know future investments and making sure we actually get out of coal and gas and oil in the context where the you know currently those companies are striving now do we give up because it's you know energy is costly and perhaps that's what we have to surround it to or do we pursue investments and do indeed go the renewable route um, I, I think the jury is still out potentially um, you know, it's, it's going to take a lot of efforts to maintain the the ship in the right direction. And then, there again, governments have a role to play. Anyway, I'll stop here just to say um, the, the complexity of, of decarbonization and, and assorted issues, as, as Christian described, is that very few organizations and indeed government think of them in, system, in systemic terms. Um, and I, I, I do believe that... Um, there is a, a mission that's incumbent upon us, but on all other actors to actually enter into a give and take exercise where you're going to lose a little bit here and win a little bit there and ultimately carry out our conversations on how do we get there together? Because there's no decarbonization possible that's driven by one sector alone. That's never going to work. Think of scope three uh, as, a, as a challenge of its own. Um, and and the added complexity is that each site, each mining site, has its own little decarbonization roadmap to work out. You know, decarbonizing in Chile is not decarbonizing in Sweden, and so all of that requires you know dialogue with um, all stakeholders and first and foremost government in, in terms of the licensing and royalties aspect of of of, of the dialogue, but also. Of future, you know, incentivizing future investments. Uh, I like your optimism, Laurent. You said that we are not going to give up, even though you can recognize that it's not easy and the conditions are not given, and maybe the transition won't happen if we don't have the the correct uh, issues there. Do you agree, Christian, with this um, with this point of view of of Laurent? Do, do you think that it's possible? 
I, I always agree with Laurent, my principal. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to take you through an exercise, which is an interesting one. Look, in philosophy, there is this, this, there is this uh, interesting um, game, if you want to call it, where a professor of philosophy asks uh, the student, where are you? Are you in your mind? Are you in your brain? Or are you in your body? No? And there is a process. And the conclusion is that regardless of what you think, you still exist. You know, um, The same is about our future. Our future is going to be radically different, regardless of whether whatever route we take. If we if we disregard climate change and we say, well, look, we're not going to uh, see, you know, we're not going to make it, then sea levels are going to rise. We're going to get tipping points, and uh, you know, the the planet will look very different. Our economy will look very different. Our societies will look very different, and that is just a matter of time. If we got the route that we really compromise, and this is the other extreme, and we put all the efforts to align with 1.5 degree scenarios, it's the same. Our, uh, you know, our societies are going to be looking very different. Our environment is going to be looking very different. There is no, there is no scenario in the future, regardless of what we think, going back to the example of philosophy, regardless of what we believe in, the future is radically different. Now, here's the trick. If we agree on that premise, then we should be acting radically, right? So if we think that the future is marginally different, then marginal change should be accepted. But if we agree that the future will be radically different, regardless of what we do, our action should be radical. Mm -hmm. and, and why am I sharing this with you? Because I work in innovation. So that's the way we understand why we're doing innovation and why innovation is so important. Innovation is not a new gadget or a new technology. That's the result of thinking differently. That's innovation. And I think what we really need to do is to start inspiring our, our leaders in governments and in companies and across industries to think differently. This is not a challenge. It's a one in a lifetime opportunity to give people in mining areas the chance to get access to better jobs, new jobs, not through the mine only, but through the renewable energy that will come, through the natural climate-based solutions that will come, yeah. forestry, uh, the regenerative ag agriculture, battery management, you know, carbon-related carbon, carbon uh, related industries. It's a one-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and it's happening. It's exciting. We can make it. But it's a radically different model. And so the moment we understand that we have big players working on that radical change already, and we can see how they are trying, and we support that change across industries, we will get a radically positive solution and a radically positive future. If we get stuck into, we need to do a little bit here and a little bit of energy there and a little bit of model here. And for that radical change, if you look at other transitions like forestry, or you look at other transitions like battery uh, development or solar, solar energy or electric vehicles, policy is crucial. You want, you, you know, the moment you see that the reduction in cost in 80 to 85 percent in solar panels, it comes with a policy package. It's not feeding tariffs or a carbon tax. It's a policy package in many key markets. So when we think about zero mining, sorry, zero carbon mining or circular mining, we need to think about a policy package. Yeah. How are we going to support mining to play the critical role it has to play? It, it, as any other transition in any other industry, you need support from policy. It's, it's just an obvious uh, statement. How do you do it in a way that you make sure that that transition is a just transition and you make sure that the materials end up in markets that are designing for recovery? That's the bit that we need to work on. Martin, that was absolutely for you, the policy package. Uh, mm -hmm. Laurent talked about technology in, the, in his first intervention, Christian, about redesigning the world, imagination, a future radically different. Uh, can we can we search for that in in policy in governments? Absolutely, and I, I actually want to thank my co-panelists here for making my life easier because I focused on uh, adaptation specific policies because I do think we need to talk more about those. But Laurent and Christian have very helpfully listed um, concerns that are broader that apply not only to the mining sector. Yes, we need carbon pricing for the entire economy. We need to address fossil fuel subsidies, not only for the mining sector, but for other sectors as well. And we need this conversation between government, 
civil society and private sector, not only with respect to mining, but with respect to an economy-wide uh, conversation that needs to happen around the transition. I think we can we can only be optimistic to the extent that all of these stakeholders, also international organization, organizations, international national, financial institutions, private or public, when we get all of these actors around the table to, to discuss discuss these various complex uh, aspects of the transition that's limited to the mining sector, but is truly a transformation of our, our economies and, and societies more broadly. And uh, academia is here to support those efforts, um, interacting with private sector, governments, uh, civil society, and finding the solutions to, to enable these policy drivers that we need to, to move forward. Wow, listening to you, I think the world is going to change for better. <laughs> uh from the private sector uh policy makers governments and innovation uh well we are now uh reaching our last uh five minutes seven minutes so i would ask each of you to uh give us your takeaways of of this discussion uh laurent over to you uh thank you i i was very interested and in, um the, the good news is that we're partners with one another, only we haven't met yet. I was very interested in hearing um, Christian's perspective on the systemic approach that's required here, because I agree with him. And um, so he doesn't just agree with me, I also agree with him. Um, we, um, we're developing, we're trying to develop visions in all these uh, areas at, uh, at ICA. But the truth is they're one and the same. Um, in the end, they, they when one ends, one, one discussion ends, it starts the other one. And in fact, you get to realize that what Christian said is is right. It's not the way to look at it. The way to look at it is through a common prism and then go for the, I guess, low-hanging fruits, if you can, uh, and then to connect with Martin's um, um, particular angle and then to formulate your your asks, your policy asks also from a systemic perspective, which I, having worked myself, I'm, I'm also from a, the policy and regulatory world uh, initially, which I know is tricky for for policymakers. You know, they're very siloed in in general, and uh, talking across different prism is what they normally do. So I think combining what Christian said and what Martin said, uh, you have um, I think a, a route to think more holistically about the topics. But then, if you want to turn that into action, you do have to articulate things in a in a way that speaks to the the, the policymakers. Which again, I, I think anticipate, and this is where I'm less optimistic bit of a disconnect there potentially I, I i really never thought a discussion about uh mining in this context would end with a smile <laughs> really. <laughs> so christian uh your takeaways please Look, I, I think we, we cannot ignore, I mean, Isabel, you, you've, you've been highlighting that this is a very upbeat and positive conversation. And I think we have to know because the challenge is just huge. And if we if, if we start to look at the barriers and, and, and the limitations, we will never reach anything because, you know, they, they exist. It's a hard place to be. What encourages me is that when I look at the mining industry maybe 10 years ago, it was a very different industry. It looked very different. It felt very different. Uh, five years ago, even when you think about climate change, I mean, how many companies were uh, consuming so much renewable energy as they do today? How many companies were actually testing so many uh, large vehicle, whole truck vehicle technologies as they are doing today? I mean, how many companies were doing 5G and, you know, testing so many kind of uh, um, uh, tailings related technology? How many were involved with actually uh, battery recycling and new uh, uh, recycling, the investing and recycling investments abroad? I mean, the mining industry is already changing. It's it's happening, uh, and I think that we need to we need to start riding that wave. We need to work together, really, to keep accelerating and keep uh, getting this motion going, because the challenge is really really tough, both in terms of scale and in terms of speed. So I think it's crucial for us to stay positive, stay focused. Um, and as Lauren was saying, you know, one le one low hungry fruit at a time, but always looking at the end point, which is this transformational vision. 
and not giving up. Martin, over to you, your takeaways. Thank you so much. I think uh, just to echo what colleagues have been saying, uh, the, tra the transition to net zero economies and systems has to happen. It is happening. And what we need are these collaborative efforts to make sure that it happens in a, a climate smart and responsible way. The challenge of the transition more broadly is immense. It involves not only mining, as we've been saying, and even just focusing on climate smart and responsible mining can be daunting. But I think we have to keep our eyes on the prize as well, thinking that if we manage to govern this transition successfully, it will generate benefits, sustainable development benefits for communities that will benefit from the transition to a more affordable, renewable energy, to sustainable climate resilient infrastructure, reduce poverty, reduce inequality, realized, materialized uh, human rights that arise out of a, a mining sector that operates in, um, in a climate smart and responsible way. We, we can picture, you know, workers benefiting from upskilling, upskilling, reskilling opportunities, allowing them to, to have access to more decent work, to, to better income to support their families in, a, in this new zero carbon economy. And we can see resource, resource rich states, especially in developing countries, uh, reaping more benefits from revenues that would also come from, from this uh, transformed forward looking industry. So I think if we keep our, our eyes on the prize rather than only thinking about the challenges that I'm not saying there won't be challenges, but we have to, to bear in mind that this collaboration will also be fruitful for, for all actors in, in society. Thank you very much, Martin. So uh, now we are reaching the end of, of this session. The transition to a net zero economy will be metal and mineral intensive. The more ambitious the targets become, the more minerals and metals will be needed to support renewable energy technologies. This session, I think, show us uh, how a virtuous cycle of climate smart and responsible mining pathways can effectively support the transition. And we, we heard uh, these experts telling us that it's possible, but we need imagination technology, we need policy packages, and uh, um, above all, we need an attitude, an attitude of not giving up because the challenge is huge, but it's possible if we think that the future can be radically, will be radically different than uh, the present is. So thank you very much to Martin, to Christian, to Laurent uh, from London, from Brussels, from New York. And thank you for watching us. And this is the end of this session. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very so much, much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. We started out with Lego bricks. We did a great team effort. And now I think we're all really, really proud to to present and see the soaks in, in real life. It's a, it's a dream come true. We selected this size because here we have the commonality with components from the electric L25 that we recently launched. I mean, most enjoyable is going from, from scratch to a machine standing there and then start to be operational. I mean, it's always great um, following up on an idea and see that it works. Now we have the prototype built. Next phase is to test and tune the prototype and see how efficient and such it will be. But the biggest question that we have still ahead of us, it's really how to collaborate with this machine at the construction site. And here we would like to have collaboration with our potential customers. Combating climate change is the biggest engineering project on the planet. And there are solutions because there is action. Braskin is removing CO2 from the atmosphere in the production of chemicals and plastics from plants. Using more and more renewable energy sources, improving the energy efficiency of our industrial units, and developing technology to transform the greenhouse gases emitted into new products. Because there is only one way to make a more sustainable future, together.